All right, welcome to the Book Club interview. My name is Scott Hollister, your host. Today we have Blaine Strickland from Florida who wrote the book Thrive, 10 Prescriptions for Exceptional Performance as a Commercial Real Estate Agent. Welcome to the show today, Blaine. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me, Scott. Thanks for being on the show. Love that we could connect through a, uh, you know, uh, fellow program that we're excited about, the CSAM organization. And I'm, I'm super excited because we were talking before that there's really not a book out there that is geared towards a commercial real estate agent and, and it has these amazing details and points that are going to really help every agent in their day-to-day -day operations. I'm excited, but before we jump in, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and where you've come from. Well, thanks. I, uh, I've been in the commercial real estate business a long, long time. My uh, father was an Air Force officer. He retired at 44 and decided to go into the commercial real estate business. And with that, I followed him in. So I studied it in school. I worked for some very large companies along the way in a lot of different roles. Um, maybe most notably for this purpose, I worked at CBRE, which is a very large brokerage firm. And I worked not only as a producer, but also as a manager and particularly a sales manager where I was trying to leverage the uh, behavior and experience and opportunities that other agents had. Uh, then I worked as a developer for many years. I started several of my own companies and ventures. I raised a lot of money. So I've had a lot of different roles in my now 40 years as a licensed agent. So um, the book uh, came out about uh, six, eight months ago but I sometimes tell people it took me 40 years to write it because it really gathers together all the wisdom that I've learned the hard way through all these many years. That's amazing. That's, that's a, that's a career in itself, right? That's a gold medal, <laughs> 40 years and something. <laughs> so I, I love the book and, and you've, you've broken it up into three parts and you teach us how to become a dominant force in our market, build a team around us and run our operation as a business. So you're the doctor, you identify the pain, diagnose the problem and treat with prescription. I love that. Simple. One, two, three, boom, boom, boom. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, the writing style and how you wrote the book around that as a doctor. Well, I hired a coach. I hired a coach uh, two years ago and said, um, in my work as a coach, I'm finding that, uh, prospects call me, prospects to be coached call me, uh, but I've noticed a couple things. Uh, number one, they call me uh, and they're in pain. And, and, and secondly, they don't hire me unless the pain is acute. Um, and so he was intrigued by that idea and suggested that I take out a box of index cards and put a different pain on each card, which I did. And that was really the genesis of the book and the, and the writing style. So we picked we picked 10 of those pains and the chapters were, are written in the same format. Each chapter starts out with what, what is the pain? Uh, the book is a series of um, prescriptions, if you will, but they're sort of anecdotes. In other words, here's the pain and then here's the diagnosis, which is why the pain is felt, why, why you hurt. And then here's the prescription. Here's what you can do about it to make it better. And so each chapter is in that same format and it's turned out to be an effective format. After that, I then grouped the pains that I had written about into these three segments that you just mentioned. But I would say maybe as a way of thinking about it overall is that uh, commercial real estate brokers, in my opinion, often do an insufficient job of seeing themselves as running a business on a platform. Uh, when a broker tells me that I'm a broker with ABC Realty, I sometimes want to stop and think about that with them and say, well, actually, you're running a small business on the ABC platform. So I would say that's sort of the heart of the, the theme really is taking more responsibility for your own operation. And mm -hmm. um, these, uh, the, the purpose of these nuggets of wisdom, if you will, these prescriptions, if you will, is to make sure that you can accelerate as much as possible to reach your potential. Oh, it's amazing. And that's what really helped me. So I'm wearing kind of two hats right now where I'm, I, you know, have my agent's license and I'm, I'm slowly building that business, but it, you know, commercials call my name and, and, and a hat as an investor. And what I liked was I went down through the 10 chapters and I was like, yep, I, I had that problem. Yep. I had that problem. Yep. And, and it, it's unique how you had it because once, you know, I transitioned from being a teacher where the work was there, you could, you know, you had it, it was structured 
to going to an agent where it's everything's open, right? If, if you don't work, you don't put food on the table. And, and just if you can get around those issues that you've talked to so many agents, you've been in the business for so long that he, here's the top 10, this is what it is. Here's how we can fix it. So I'd love to go, you know, each chapter, if we can hit each chapter and, and kind of talk about the main bullet points and, sure. and as a beginning agent, so prospecting, what is prospecting from a basic level? Well, uh, let me remind us that uh, the book is not written to uh, to brand new agents, you know, how to get started. So when you said that you've experienced these pains, what that tells me is that you've been in process, you've tried to prospect, you've tried to undertake some of the things that we're going to talk about here. And the reason that that's important is because the very first chapter on prospecting, as an example, is called prospecting is no fun and I'm too busy anyway which it's right there is a paradox like, well, you must not need to prospect if you're so busy. Um, many people are told, of course, that any sales position is a numbers game. The more people you talk to, the more money you'll make. What I've found is that uh, a lot of brokers, particularly over the last six and six or seven years, as we've come out of the great recession and, and generally it's been sunnier times. And generally if you hang around and do the right thing, you'll be busier than you were. Um, my suggestion is to name 125 top prospects and focus on those. So it's simple math. If you take 125 prospects and you decide you're going to touch each of them with a, in a high quality way once a quarter so that you would have four touches per year, that simply means that you got to make two touches per day. So two touches per day over 13 weeks equals 125 uh, touches. Now, you might not get them all. You might have to leave some messages. You might have to, uh, they, they won't call you back. You miss them somehow. And of course, that doesn't count as a high quality touch. But if you make that your goal, by the end of the year, you would be able to say, well, I didn't make thousands of calls. I actually only made 500 calls. Uh, and I made all those calls count. So I am busy, but I wedged two high quality touches per day into my day and did that as a priority. And by the way, I make this comment in the in the book, it doesn't supplant other marketing efforts. If, if you have a big database and you like to blast out emails or you have other marketing channels, I'm all for that. My goal is just to make sure that you get at least those two high quality touches in per day. And, and that's amazing. And that's what I found. You know, we were just talking about coaches before and and that's the thing is it is being consistent and having something you can hold yourself accountable to, right? Blaine, you just said it. It's two touches per day. I'm like, that. that's it? It's just, it sounds so simple, but executing is the hard part. And I love that. And you talk about a top of mind system. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, the the idea is that if you pick the right 125 people, and, and I make this case in the book, and the way I phrase it is, is that the, these 125 people would get pregnant at least once every five years. And pregnant means they give birth to a deal that you want to do. Um, so if you're uh, conscious of what your niche is and how you're specializing, you should be able to at least start the process of crafting a list of 125 players that would uh, matter to you in your specialization, in your niche. And and by the way, they might not all be principals. That I'm okay with talking to the director of the chamber of commerce or the banker or the appraiser, uh, someone who influences uh, the birth of these deals. So if if you pick the right 125 people, then theoretically that would mean that 125 deals would go down one per person over a five year if it was a perfectly scientific picking, which of course it won't be. But the simple question is, is if you could identify 125 deals in advance that were going to happen, what action would you take? Well, you, what you would do is you would, you would build a relationship through call after call after call, making sure that when they were ready, you came to their mind first. The, mm -hmm. the big click here is it's not trying to call them on the day that they need you, but ensuring that they call you on the day that you need them, that they need you. So what happens is that you're going to have a hard time, you know, making that call where somebody goes, Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable that you called me. I was just thinking I needed a broker. Uh, instead they call and they say, Hey, you know, we've been talking for the last couple of years. You got time for lunch. And that's usually code for something has come up and I want to talk to you about it. And that's the play. That's what you, that's what you work for is for them to call you. That's beautiful. Being top of mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
What about having more projects? Be in, you, you, you mentioned it briefly is, is being more busy and not having the time. So in chapter two, you talk about more than you can manage and using some type of tool. So what tool do you like to use? Well, I'm, a, I'm, a, um, I'm enough of a project manager from my days in the development business to understand and use Gantt charts. And so um, many of us, if we looked around, we would find that Gantt charts are used by architects, by contractors, by project managers, by engineers. Uh, if, you, if you were to Google a Gantt chart, uh, you would find that software engineers are using them every day. And it's a simple hundred year old tool that creates a visual representation of how a project unfolds. So what I like to say is every building that you've ever sold or leased was built by someone holding a Gantt chart. And it's sort of interesting to me that when we then um, transact that property, let's say the property was built for five million five years ago and now you're selling it for eight million. Well, when it was at $5 billion, it merited a Gantt chart. But now that we're selling it for eight million, it's like, no, I don't have time for that. Let's just, let's just make a, take a picture and throw it out there. And what I'm trying to get people to think about is uh, we can treat these transactions as a project and see ourselves as project managers. Frankly, that's what our clients want. Um, and so what the Gantt chart does is give you the ability to help someone see exactly what the process that you're going to take them through will be. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, some brokers use it. And the brokers who read this chapter and get back to me, is like, oh, man, you gave away my big secret. <laughs> and so my hope is just that we could all be better project managers by using the tool that every project manager um, uses. Another quick thought there is if you see a crane in your town and at the bottom of that crane, there's a construction trailer and you go in that trailer, there's a young person in there, you know, scrutinizing the Gantt chart, scouring the Gantt chart, making sure that first we got to get this to happen, then this has to happen and this has to happen. So when you see a crane, just remember there's a Gantt chart at the heart of that. I love that. It's beautiful. So, you know, this is uh, a thing I struggle with the most is, you know, too much time gets wasted on deals that fall apart in the end. And you said you talk about due diligence process in the beginning to kind of weed through. And I struggle with that with years. You know, I spent six months on a project and it just went away, you know, and, and, and that, that hurts in the end. So if there's something in the beginning to focus on the ones that have the most merit or the most promise, uh, I'm all ears about it. Well, you know, when you were a teacher, uh, Scott, you were an employee and your department head or your principal said, okay, you're going to teach seventh grade and, and here's, the, here's the ropes and here's what we need to do and here's the calendar and here's who your partners are and here's when the tests are and things like that. So it's a very defined path. And, and frankly, you get paid uh, in some ways, regardless of how well you do. Um, I, I mean, that's the big challenge with teaching, of course, is it's you know, there's not a lot of merit pay there. Um, in our world, as an independent contractor, you have to choose which projects to work on. And if you were to choose poorly, meaning that you choose projects that you work on, but then don't pay off, um, the seller still has the property, the buyer still has the cash, and, and, and you don't have anything to show for it. You've, you've invested time that is permanently gone. So my mm -hmm. first question would be is, so if you could choose more effectively, what would that look like? If you could just be prescient and choose more effectively, what kinds of things would you undertake? Well, as you become more experienced, uh, you have seen deals fall through for what I call the right reasons and the wrong reasons. Um, the, the right reasons are that something changed that wasn't expected. Um, the, the, the business went way down for one side or the other, the property was condemned, the road, the zoning wasn't approved, some things that you can't control. But mm -hmm. if you lose a deal because you discover that there were environmental problems and at the end, the environmental problems overwhelm the parties and they don't transact, I would, I would point to you and say, well, that could have been known. You could have done the environmental report at the beginning and known that this was a challenge that you were gonna have to resolve. So if you look at it, I don't want to use the word selfishly, but if you look at it as that you're a stakeholder in the transaction as well as the buyer and the seller, then we need this to pay off for all the stakeholders. And one of the ways that you can do that is use your experience to force as much due diligence at the front end uh, so that the parties identify the challenges and resolve those challenges as quickly as possible and purposefully, intently, as opposed to getting to the end and then there's a bombshell report that comes in with two days to go that can't be managed very effectively. So um, 
it's it's a it's a topic of great discussion. Uh, there are other people who have written due diligence checklists, et cetera. But my suggestion to the to the brokers out there is choose wisely. Don't lose deals for the wrong reason. And the best way to do that is to think through what due diligence is going to come to play and see if you can move that to the front end of the deal. That's beautiful. And I remember reading another book and talking to another person this year and so someone suggested that you put a dollar amount to your time. So sure. if, if you're going to invest way too much into something, make sure it's worth it. And yeah, I, I would, I would, uh, it's, <laughs> you know, the dollar per hour concept, uh, it can be done historically where you can look back and say, well, I made a hundred thousand dollars and I worked 2000 hours this year. So I made $50 an hour. And that's a great time management tool, but you can see what would happen if you invested a hundred hours in a project, as an example, that didn't come through, it would be like me coming to your house, holding out my hand, you write me a check for $5,000 and I leave and you get nothing for that. Uh, you can only bear that so many times. Mm, yep. <laughs> well said. <laughs> now, what about being dominant in our niche and what do you recommend from, you know, a coaching standpoint, uh, you know, a brand new commercial brokers coming in his first one to three years and you're, you're talking to them, you're giving advice. What does that look like? How does that conversation go? Uh, there's two or three things to think about generally there. Uh, first of all, the more urban the market that you're in, the more you're going to be required to specialize. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to tell the story of two different brokers. One is in Panama City, Florida, who told me, Blaine, I have to specialize in everything. In other words, to have enough transactions to make a living in Panama City, I got to do land sales and condo rentals and and uh, I've got to lease office space and retail space and I got to sell forest land and, you know, I got to do a lot of things. And I contrast that with a broker who told me one time that his whole territory was the Sears Tower. In other words, all he did was ride up and down the elevator bank in the Sears Tower, the Willis Towers, it's now called, because it's so big and there's so many prospects in there. In fact, he actually had a partner. So his, his territory was elevator bank 67 through 132 and the other guy was one through 66. And so um, the larger your urban area, the more you're going to have to specialize, number one. Number two, the younger you are, the more you need to specialize. Because when you're young, uh, the players in the market will only deal with you if they perceive you to hold crystallized, valuable knowledge. So a young guy who runs around, guy or gal who runs around just trying to do everything is going to be lost in the shuffle. Uh, but if you become dominant in the sense that you own the market data uh, about a particular specialty or a particular niche, um, then you will become powerful much more quickly. So that's the idea in general of figuring out what your niche is and then starting down the path of how to dominate it. I don't even address market knowledge in this book. I assume that you have market knowledge. And, and let me just go down that path for just a minute. Mm -hmm. As an example, <clears throat> I work with a guy who does nothing but sell self-storage properties. And so instead of staying in a close area, he covers five states. In other words, he is so deep into that niche that he has to cover five states to get enough transactions to make it worthwhile. And, and so if you said, well, I do self-storage and I do land and I do retail leasing and I, and I sell some marina slips, then I would say, oh, so you're the Panama City type that has to do everything you can in a geographic area. My suggestion would be to become very deep in a niche. Mm -hmm. That's how you become an expert. I love yeah, it. Right. Administration tasks. This is a very important chapter. I think chapter five, you know, having our dollar per hour figure and, and working our highest and best task. Now you have to employ an assistant in this chapter. And, and can you talk about how your commercial you know, life was before the assistant that you hired and then after and how that difference was? Yeah, actually, there's two chapters sort of back to back in regard to this issue because it comes up so often. Um, the, the first task is, is that uh, uh, producers that reach a certain level of productivity, pro productivity realize that they cannot go any farther unless they get someone to help them. And so then the question becomes, how do I bring somebody in to help me? What kinds of things should they work on and what kind of things should I work on? And it's a pretty simple answer. Generally, the producer needs to make sure that they maximize the time that they spend in, in deal development, business development. In other words, you cannot delegate calling on customers, but you can delegate the preparation of marketing materials, uh, fundamental compliance issues, uh, market research. And so that's how a lot of producers end up looking for assistance. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple issues that I address in the book is that 
um, frequently what happens is they try to pay those assistants on a variable basis. In other words, they make them part of their commission program. I'll give you 10% of whatever I make. Uh, and I usually find that that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because the people who want to help you to serve you in these areas are not focused on business development. They, they can't change the business development play. You're in charge of that. So I recommend that you employ them and you give them a job and a description and a task that is a, that they are able to accomplish. And if they do a great job, you can certainly uh, bonus them. But, but um, what I see many times is someone will say, just follow me around and pick up whatever you can and I'll give you 10 or 15 or 20% of whatever we make. Uh, and it, it just doesn't work. Um, I've seen people that get paid way too much on that formula uh, for what they do, and it causes friction. So my suggestion is, is that you define the tasks, employ somebody to help you, and, and I make the point that ultimately it would be great if you could find someone who could accelerate you, not merely wait to be delegated to, but begins to say, show me, let me help you, let me do more. I want to learn that. I want to help you maximize the time that you have for productivity. And what about in, in your career? Let's say you're, you're just starting out. Is there, is there a tipping point where, you know, you don't have enough consistent income when, you, when it's your first year? Do you, do you recommend that you, you kind of are jack of all trades, getting out there and learning the business and, and doing all you can be? And then at what point do you look to to get an assistant? Well, first of all, I don't recommend that you hire an assistant until you have mastered those tasks. In other words, I want you to bring somebody in that you can show them exactly what you expect and show them how to do a good job and even how to show them like, gosh, if you were to able to advance this, that this is what the future would look like. You would do an even better job in this area, number one. <clears throat> number two, I would say that um, most people wait way too long. The common statement that we all hear is, I should have done this two years ago. And so when I repeat that to people, then what that looks like is they frequently have to make the decision to expand their capacity before they really have the work to fill it. And that's the challenge. In other words, if you think through the flip side of, I should have done it two years ago, oh, well, why didn't you? Well, because I wasn't sure I would have the work. So now you're even busier, the problem is even more aggravated. Now you have to have somebody to buy tomorrow, you're in a hurry, it, 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 you can just see where that goes. So what I would suggest is, um, in today's world, these jobs are not forever. I would hire in advance. I would develop my capacity first, um, and it, which, which will do two things. It will give you more time to make calls. It'll also keep you motivated to make more calls when you look over and see that assistant who you know you have to pay. A little mm -hmm. payroll stress will keep you in the marketplace. You know, will, will keep you out there. But, but if that person has free time, you should make sure that they have some learning things that they can work on as opposed to always being, you know, I got to get this done by today and say, look, take some, t if, if you have free time, take some time to learn this, take some time to learn this. And what will happen is the productivity and the ability of the assistant will grow simultaneously. Good to know. Now, what about making mistakes over and over again? In I love how you said this, you know, refine your goals and create revealing metrics. Mm -hmm. So, I love that because if we don't have the heart of our why, you know, at our forefront every day, you know, it's, oh, you know, I'll get to it when I can. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you mean by refining your goals? Well, there, there are, um, a, there's a lot of written material out there. A lot of authors out there are talking about, uh, you know, uh, what matters most. And there's an old saying in the property management business, you can expect what you inspect. And, and so, the, the idea here is, is that you have got to find a way to create meaningful metrics for yourself. There are dashboard softwares now. There are many, many books about KPIs, key, key, key performance uh, indicators, uh, OKRs. And there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, materials out there talking about how important measurement is. And we've never been able to measure more effectively than we can today. Uh, so, um, you know, that's kind of step one in terms of goal setting. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're establishing goals, um, make those goals so clear that you can measure against those goals and see how you're doing. Um, in the appendix to my book, I mention a book called uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution, which is written by uh, Stephen Covey's son and some others. Um, and just a brief run through that book will help you think through the importance of setting goals that can be measured. Let me say one more thing. If you were in business for yourself and running a restaurant 
or a hair salon or a dental office or a landscape business, you would have a cash register. And if you had a cash register, cash registers today, cash registers today provide measurement, right? In other words, that's the whole point of having SKUs and inventory control systems. And we're sort of like, nah, I don't really work that way. And it's like, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yep. Yeah, no, I love that. And especially the appendix in the back with the, with the other recommendations. And anytime that, you know, we were talking about before, if, you know, what books in common and, and what can be supported with this book. And, and I love that when you, and you're a book guy too, and talking about good books and, you know, anytime, you know, you, you have a 40 year career, right. And, and you've learned through other people and you've put what you are an expert together. And I love that. And we can, we can get inside your mind 40 years in, in just, you know, a few hours. It's impressive. Well, thank you. I, um, my, you know, somewhere as a child, a parent, a teacher. In fact, my book is dedicated to my fourth grade teacher, as you know. And so I give her the credit for really instilling in me a long, long time ago, the joy of learning. And so to the extent that I've been a coach and an instructor and a professor, et cetera, that's all code for learning. And mm -hmm. that means you, you make time to expose yourself to other ideas and, um, I, just as I'm looking at you, there's got to be a hundred books behind you on the shelf there. And, and I, I, I make reference to that in my appendix there, I got a shelf too. Here's some books that I really like. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. Always learning. That's the key, right? That, that was one of the biggest strong points you told me in the book. We'll get to that before we wrap things okay. up. But okay. what about, you know, working on a team and, mm -hmm. you know, having, you know, the wrong player in the wrong seat. Have you ever dealt with that? Well, I can see in the background over your left shoulder, the book, Good to Great, which was written by Jim Collins uh, 15, 16 years ago. I've heard mm -hmm. Collins speak. He's brilliant. He's got a great research team. He's written other books. No one argues the validity of the points that he made in that book. <clears throat> and the way most people summarize it is there's three big lessons. Great leaders do three things. Number one, get the right people on the bus. Number two, get those people in the right seats. And number three, get the wrong people off the bus. And what I find, um, in my travels is that a lot of producers completely understand the first two. Um, they struggle with the third one. The, he, what Colin says is the reason you have to get the wrong person off the bus is because there's no greater detractor to the right people. In other words, you could say, well, they don't really produce. They're not really covering their costs. You know, they're kind of a, they're kind of a negative personality or they're whatever the issue is. Um, they're distracted, whatever it is. Um, those can all be true, but if you want to get the right people performing at the top level, you got to, you got to surround them with like kind. Um, and so that whole idea of working with a team and being in charge of a team is that you must take a uh, look at your team and make sure that you are meeting those three criteria. Here, here's what happens a lot of times in small firms, which is, and I make this point in the book, which is things change. You, you know, you start out and then pretty soon you join together with a partner and pretty soon you get someone to help you. And 10 years goes by and all of a sudden there's seven people on your team and the person that you hired to help you in the beginning really hasn't advanced. And so the market, the speed, the market, the knowledge has advanced and you have to look back. And I've had people tell me, Blaine, that person has been extremely loyal to me over the last 10 years. I'm not taking them off you know, work around them. And that's, I, I totally understand. I totally understand that logic and I appreciate that logic, but I would suggest to you that they know that they've been bypassed as well. And so the best thing to do is, you know, in effect, repurpose them, help them find a new purpose, either on your team or someplace else. Um, now the flip side of that is I've been part of big companies that will issue a RIF and 1500 people lose their job, a reduction in force, 1500 people lose their job just because of the title that they held. So the other end of the spectrum is we got to cut costs. Let's cut these 1500 people. Whew, that's done. Let's go to lunch. So I get the range from the small company who's too loyal to a fault and the big company who's too harsh to a fault. So we got to kind of find the mid range in there. And that's what I discuss. That's what I explore in that chapter. Well, that's a great leader. I remember, you know, talking about a teacher and, you know, some people just, you know, being in the right seat at the right time. And, and I think that's the most important thing that you just said, repurpose them, right? You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's just, it's the same thing. And if they've been there, you, you help them, give them a hand. So you find that middle ground. That, that's, that's some great advice. Well, Collins, Collins makes the point that uh, if you have the right people on the bus, sometimes it means there still will be tension. In other words, they, they're passionate, they care, they, they, you know, they're, they're st everybody's still kind of trying to figure it out. 
but when when the right people are on the bus, the complaints about one another will be um, sort of phrased in a positive way, like ah, he's so headstrong, you know, he he believes in what he says so strongly that sometimes we can't get any, make any progress, which is a different criticism than I don't trust that person, hmm. and and that's a different that's a different issue, or I don't think that person really cares. Um, th those are a different type of problem. So that's when you can tell that you got to kind of keep working maybe to get them in the right seats. And when, the, when you know, for, you know, probably for five minutes one day, there'll be total harmony. So make sure you don't miss that. Um, and that everybody's in the, together in the right seat. But other than that, you know, management is a challenge. Um, but generally, if you're advancing the cause and moving down the process, by the way, I would just mention to you that Collins makes this point, which is uh, many times firms get more done with less, uh, or to say it differently, a few good people, you know, the, 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 you know, the Marines, the few, the proud, well, mm -hmm. the, a few good Marines can get a lot of work done. Um, and so don't be thinking that you've got to have 10 people because the other team has 10 people. You could, you might be able to get it done with four people. Yeah. I remember talking with a commercial agent out of Texas this year. He's, he's like, I went crazy with 10, 20 people. He's like, I've cut back down to two to three producers. He's like, my, my life is just so much better. So it's a good note to make. You know? Yeah, you know, typically what happens is that we overshoot. We constantly overshoot. So things are going well. We add on our team, and then we realize, boy, we got a lot of overhead, or we, or maybe it's just emotional overhead, just a lot of people to take mm -hmm. care of. And so I would just say that if we could generally uh, be disciplined enough to satisfy ourselves that this is the right person, then we don't overhire. We don't get too far along. The right people are hard to find. Uh, you got to work at it. You got to. Sometimes it takes years to get that person to to join the team. So I think if we can be conscious of exactly what we're looking for. What are those attributes that would cause me to believe this is the right person? And if you stay disciplined to that, as opposed to, I don't know, uh, I had one guy tell me, you know, she made great eye contact. She laughed at all my jokes. She seemed like she had good experience. Uh, and I hired her. And then three months later, I fired her. I said, well, why? And she said, well, she couldn't do anything on Excel. And I said, well, was that, did you test for that? Did you ask about that? He goes, no, she made great eye contact. And I'm like, uh, okay, well, you know, there you go. Yep. Lesson learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, chapter nine, you talk about hating the time of year and, you know, dread always having to start over. Uh, you talk about having a, a cash flow projection. So what type, what time of year are you talking about and what do you mean by a cash flow projection? Well, that particular line comes out of a conversation I had maybe five or six years ago where a guy told me right about this time of the year, you know, early December, I hate this time of year. I'm like, I kind of like, wow, recoiled. Really? Why? It would seem like, you know, it's the holidays, there's more family. Of course, it's a little busier, but you know, you can figure out how to manage that. But also for a broker, uh, many times it means that they're in the highest part of the waterfall. You know, some guys have a, a waterfall commission structure where they make 50% up to a certain number, then it goes to 60, and then they go to 70. So late in the year, typically most brokers are maximizing the amount of, of split that they get. Uh, they're also a lot of times trying to close that year end deal. In other words, the principals themselves want to close the deal in this tax year. So it was a little unusual for me to hear that. And so when I explored it, what he basically said was, well, three weeks from now, I have to start over. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I go back down to the lower split. Um, um, and then I have to start, you know, building back my business again. So what we did is we crafted a pipeline report on a napkin. And when we did that, um, and remember, this is a top producer, so he had deals in progress, but he had never written them down. In fact, you'll hear sometimes brokers say, oh, no, I never write my deals down. That's bad karma, which is just completely humorous. Um, <laughs> but, you, you know, it's like, oh, I can't possibly talk about my deal. Oh, you mean the principals and the lawyers and the architects and the landlords are talking about the deal, but you don't want to talk about <laughs> yeah. it because you might jinx it. Uh, yeah. So... Basically, what happened was is that he was going to be back in the top tranche by like March 1st. And I said, boy, it must be awful. It just must be awful to know that 11 weeks from now, you'll be back at the top tranche. That doesn't feel like starting over to me. And believe it or not, it was a revelation. Hmm. And um, then I began to explore, why does this guy not have a pipeline report? Why does he not see himself as running a business with a cash flow record and a cash flow projection? And so... Um, uh, what you're referring to here is the uh, necessary 
uh, reporting element that is commonly called a pipeline report in our world. And I feel so strongly about it. In effect, as you know, there's three chapters in the book about this issue. Um, I just feel that any other small business person, that small business owner that grossed 1 million or 2 million or 3 million or 5 million or 17 million, as I've seen some of these teams do, of course they would have a cash flow projection. Of course they would have a pipeline report. Um, and somehow we got into this sort of, uh, you know, um, delusional karma like, uh, I don't really keep track of it. I just come in every day and throw stuff at the wall and see if it sticks. And it's like, well, you can do that if you want, but that's, that's not running a business. Hmm. Well said. And, you know, before we wrap things up, I want to talk about a few more points and, and what I've been doing, you know, when purchasing these books and, and, and this is the best part is every, every 90 or days or so I, I try to have, you know, plan out my new quarter, you know, plan the year and quarters, 90 day plan, you know, down to the monthly plan, down to the weekly plan and being organized. And what I love about this book is, you know, I'm wearing a few different hats right now. And if I love referring back to some chapter, I'm like, okay, what am, what's not clicking in my life? And, and I, I love having the physical copy, but I just saw that, you know, your Amazon number one bestseller. So congrats on that. I felt like I had to bring that up. It's a, that's a huge, you know, feat for this is the first book you've written. You said, that's right. Um, thank you. Um, I sell the book in both Kindle and hardcover format, and it's been fascinating to see that these Kindles have sold all over the world. I don't know anybody in Australia or New Zealand or Japan <laughs> or China, uh, but I'm happy to sell them a book. Of course, the reason that they do that is because they can download it instantly and it doesn't have a massive shipping charge. Um, Maybe Great. the next thing I'll do is uh, produ produce an audio book because I listen to a lot of books on tape, as you do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if I can sell three more books, then I'm going to invest in uh, creating an audio book file as well. Well, that's great. Now, you know, before we wrap things up, so best place to find out more about you. And I just, uh, we were, you know, probably talking for a couple of weeks before this, but I, you know, I see that you're coming out with a webinar this week as well. So you want to tell the audience a little bit more, you know, about your business and what you're doing these days? Uh, sure. Um, the best, the only place to find out really more about me would be my website, which is HBS. Those are my initials. Pretty tricky, huh? HBS dash resources.com. And you can, it's, I've retooled it. I think it's easy to, to um, understand. You can see the things that I do, the people that I work with, but you, there's a place there to click on the book. You can learn more about the book. You can see the video where I introduce it, but it's also available on Amazon. It's, and you certainly can type in thrive Blaine Strickland, at, at Amazon and see it. Um, by the way, uh, I just want to make two quick comments about this time of year. Uh, number one, we've, um, we, we've got a promo code out there that you can find easily to buy it as a gift. I think it's a perfect gift for your favorite CRE broker. And secondly, I want to point out that the book is only 100 pages long and the chapters are six pages each because I know that I have multitasking uh, busy brokers. And so to your point that people are referring back to it, um, it's, it's really, you know, you read the book from cover to cover, but a lot of people will, will look at the table of contents and jump directly to the pain that they feel the most. And I'm okay with that. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the theory would be that this book would be on the shelf, hopefully stay on the shelf. And mm -hmm. you could go back and look at it and go, Oh yeah. And within 15 minutes in the reading of one chapter, you could uh, hopefully make some progress on the issue that you're working on. And that's what I said, you know, about referring back to it's, it's just, I've, I've never had good luck reading a book, let it sit for years. I'm like, mm -hmm. and recently I'm, I'm recircling back. I'm like, okay. And, and we're talking before and we're talking about certain books on the shelf. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a book. Yep. Uh, chapter six. Okay. Yep. I have an issue. Okay. The assistant got it. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's the point of the webinars that you mentioned is that if you go to my website, you can click on resources. And so I think I have four or five 40-ish minute webinars where I explore uh, a, a chapter in the book. So as an example, I, I'm not quite sure when all this will come out, but this week I'm going to be producing the webinar on the chapter called Power to Convene, Use Your Power to Convene. And, uh, but regardless of when you make it to the website or when you hear this, uh, if you're interested in the book, you can read about that. But if you're interested in discussion about any given chapter, there might be a webinar there for you. That's amazing. Different learning styles and being able yeah. to learn in addition, just reading. So they're very helpful. And, for the and you can call me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Turns out I work live too. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, that's great. Blaine. No, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you again for writing the book. I think it's, 
like you said, it's, it's no easy task to, you know, work very hard at something for the majority of life for 40 plus years and, and being able to give it away for basically free. I, and I, that's my firm belief in every book, you know, they're extremely undervalued, especially this one that you can refer back to instantly. And, and, and we talked about certain struggles that you're going to, you're going to have. And, and here's the prescriptions. It's ve- very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's been great to interact with you. You know, I come from a family of coaches. So I think this sort of coaching, trying to help others is in my DNA. I don't take credit for that directly. I've had great teachers. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm just trying to pass it on. And that's very, um, that's a lot of emotional compensation for me. So it's been fun to have these kind of conversations. And I appreciate what you've done today. Well, thank you, Blaine. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that concludes our book club interview with author Blaine Strickland, who wrote the book Thrive, 10 Prescriptions for Exceptional Performance as a Commercial Real Estate Agent. Blaine is a lifetime veteran of the commercial real estate industry. He earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees in real estate from the University of Florida, and he was one of the first salespersons hired in the new CBRE office in Tampa, Florida in 1982. Along the way, Blaine developed his skills as a teacher and coach, and he's been a highly rated adjunct professor at the University of Florida and UNC Chapel Hill. He has been a senior instructor for the CCIM Institute for the past decade. He's a sought-after speaker on many industry topics, and today, Blaine is primarily focused on his coaching and consulting business. He currently lives in Orlando, Florida with his wife of 37 years. I just want to thank Blaine so much for coming on the show today and giving us so much valuable information for our commercial real estate agents that are tuning in. Uh, It's a great book. I highly recommend it sit on your shelf because you can refer back to it very easily. Like he said, the chapters are short and concise, and, and that's exactly what we need as busy professionals. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and iTunes to stay up to date to the authors we're interviewing and the newest podcasts we are putting out. And I'll make sure to link everything in the show notes that you need to find out more about Blaine and where to purchase his book. My name is Scott Hollister, your host, and we'll see you next time.